um, if we want to release rolling upgrades, we would have a load balancer, which would uh, direct small percentage of traffic to the new code that we're trying to deploy. And that's where we, we can validate if things are working fine. And we call it the canary. The canary is basically, we're gonna test out if everything's working fine uh, before we roll it out to most of the users. So this functionality is very critical because this allows us for smaller upgrades. This allows us for frequent upgrades instead of making a lot of changes at the same time and potentially breaking everything, right? So we can roll back changes. So this functionality is very important. And how do we get to this, right? Because think about it, this could be very uh, complex. Uh, in this, I'm just showing one web service with code version one and code version two, but there could be multiple microservices, hundreds of microservices, and they could all be running at various different versions. So how does the user get a consistent experience and the foundation of that is data encoding. And for that, we need to understand what is backward compatibility and what is forward compatibility so that all kinds of users using old services, old websites, uh, also work with new web services with new websites, right? So let's take an example because this can get complex. So let's take this step one. Let's say this is the green user um, and he's trying to type in a form which just supports one field, just one field, first name. And that old website takes in the first name from this user and then writes it to the database. Okay, great, successful. Now, let's say you're trying to enhance your form and you wanna introduce the last name. Okay, so you, now you want to have the canary. Remember from the previous slide, you have this green machine that's canarying the new code with the new form field. And now this user now can enter the first name and the last name with this new website. And, and when they enter the first name and the last name, the first name and last name, both are saved. So far, so good. Number one and number two. Now think about this. What if a user, user two, goes back to um, this service, right? Somehow talks to this service or there's another user who, who is in the same category, right? Who was, uh, um, uh, had the new data. Right, so let's say user two goes to the old website or the old form page and tries to retrieve the data. Remember, user two wrote in first name and last name. The old website just understands the first name. How would this work, right? Because as you try to re deploy new re new code bases, there's bound to be this discre discrepancies, right? So it gets the data from the database and it sees, oh, first name, I get it. Last name, what is that? So it's just gonna ignore it, okay? So it returns to the user first name. Right? So it continues to work. Right? When the old website continues to work, when the new changes get propagated, then that old web service or this website is called uh, forward compatible. Right? Similarly, the opposite is backward compatible. Right? Like when a new web service continues to serve an old client or, an, or a request uh, that it uses the old data store, right? like it, uh, the new website should understand the first name and last name, but it on the data store, it only gets the first name. So then it put in default values and then still works for the user. So that's backward incompatibility, right? So backward incompatibility in short is that the newer code bases can read data that was written by the older code bases, right? And still work for both the old and the new client. Of course, it'll work for the new client because it's a new code base, but it should also work for the old. That's backward and backward compatibility. And forward compatibility is when the old code base, right, here, continues to work even with the new data, right? Maybe ignoring it, but also there's a trick here. What if it, it gets the first name and does it write and overwrite the last name with empty? That's something to be careful of when you implement. Ideally, you should leave the last name untouched and not overwrite it because it's new data. And so there are different types of schemas and validations that, that can come into play. But this is data encoding um, because once you understand code compatibility, you need to understand like what data it is because this data is not really stored in plain text. It's stored in encoded manner. And each of these encoded data stores have a schema associated with it. So for us to release code uh, in an agile fashion, you need to understand how your data is encoded, how forward and backward compatibility comes into play. So take, let's take another simple example, username, favorite number, and interests, right? I have two array of two interests. If I wanna save this data store, and let's say I have an object in my, in, in my application, 
that has these three fields, right? One is a number, one is a string, and one is an array. And so if I want to, you know, in this service, the data is being passed around, right, from the web store to the database, to from the database to the new web service, and so on and so forth. So when this data moves from a service, from in-memory to database, it has to be encoded and sent across the wire, right? This is a network connection. So that process is called encoding. When you take the raw data or the raw object that you have and you convert it into uh, an encoded set of bytes, which are optimized for storage, optimized for uh, read and parsing and everything, it's called encoding. It's also called serialization, it's also called marshalling, same thing. Similarly, the opposite. When you read the encoded data and you want to you know, extract that binary data or some encoded data into something that's convertible to an object or to a plain text that the user understands called decoding or deserialization, unmarshalling. The same set of things in an opposite, right? So encoding and decoding is very important because there are various ways of encoding and decoding. There could be language-specific formats that you can use uh, in, in Java. You have Java IO serializable. Um, but a lot of uh, downsides of doing that. But um, but there are various text-based uh, encoding as well, like oh, you know, CSV, JSON, XML, and others, uh, which are verbose but human-readable. They're um, but they, they take a lot of space in storage. Similarly, there are multiple binary encoding mechanisms, which have various performances. And for this specific example here, right, if I were to save this JSON object or this JSON uh, text into text JSON, it'll take uh, 60, uh, 81 bytes. But if I were to store it in binary form, I would store it in 66 bytes. I don't know how much benefit we have if we were to convert uh, this into binary because the readability is lost. But the same data uh, can be stored using thrift, which is another uh, mechanism from Facebook, uh, in a binary form in 59 bytes and for thrift binary. And then there's thrift compact version that stores in 34 bytes. And there's protocol, protobuf uh, from uh, Google, which stores this in 33 bytes. And there's Avro, which was also another thing introduced five, 10 years ago, uh, which stores in 32 bytes. So you see there's various mechanisms for encoding this. And there are different mechanisms in which how each of these encoding mechanisms work. And there are pros and cons to each one of them. For example, Avro doesn't have the tag um, tag names, right? Or even the tag IDs. Like these are, these usernames, um, favorite number, interests are keys. In Protobuf and Thrift, they're converted into tag IDs. And so they don't store the exact name over and over, which just takes so much space. In Avro, they don't even store that. There's a schema associated. Each of these have schemas, um, but there's various optimizations that they do to get to different encoding. So it's very important for you to understand what encoding mechanisms are you using? What, uh, what does it support in terms of forward and backward compatibility? Because if you don't, then your services, if you release those service microservices, uh, it can break the user's experience. So that's how this is all connected. Deep understanding of how your data is encoded and decoded, how your changes actually propagate all the way back to the user so that when you try to canary and when you do rolling upgrades, it doesn't break. So, and there are various data transfer use cases. In this diagram, I've shown data moving from the web service to the database, but you know from here to here. Uh, and again, from the database to the new website or the new web service, but there are there are four other the total four different ones that are summarized in this chapter. So you can you know store this into the file. You can store it to the database which we covered. You can also call external services right like using let's say Restly is also an RPC based um, uh, JSON over HTTP uh, protocol that that LinkedIn has uh, come up with. Um, and there are many ways in which service communications also happen right. Uh, so you can think about this web service talking to this web service and that that was the service to service communication it could be within the data center it could be even over the internet so async service communication is a very different topic a huge topic in itself and there are various ways of doing it soap uh, with wsdl uh, was something that came up very early on rpc came in after it, it's all based on rpc underneath uh, but they have a different mechanism on which how they implement this right uh, so service-to-service -service communication also has this data encoding. There's also async services uh, and async message passing that happens 
from a service to, uh, let's say, a message broker, right? And so through Kafka, through RabbitMQ, sorry for the spelling here, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ. So there are many ways in which data transfer happens. And so for us to really understand all of those use cases and make sure that compatibility is not lost is the basis. It's the basis for us to make sure that when we roll out incremental changes in Canary that our user experience doesn't break, the old clients continue to you know, work. Because think about it, when you upgrade uh, your web service to add new fields, your mobile, Sarah, mobile app users might not even upgrade for a very long time. And so it needs to continue to work for them. That's backward compatibility. So it's very important for us to understand these concepts and it's for us to pick the right encoding mechanism so that we have the best performance, but at the same time, our use cases are solved for. All right, I will see you in the next chapter. This is a fantastic book so far. I would highly, highly recommend all of you to go get it. Um, thank you.